Um, you ready? So, quick video on caping out bighorn sheep. It's kind of the same thing as when you uh, do bucks or bulls. Um, some people say six inches from the back. What I do is I go down about midway. That way, if you mess up, the taxidermist has a lot more to do. I've talked to a bunch of different taxidermists. Um, they say the more, the further you take back, the better for them in case if something happens. Um, typically, what you're going to do is you're going to follow the spine all the way back up to the back of his head. So you kind of draw an imaginary line. And then uh, some people will skin out the head all the way. But my motto is, is that's what you pay the taxidermist for. And there's a good chance that you can screw it up. So I figure I try to go to the back of the head and then I'll just roll it and then take as uh, far back of the vertebrae as we need. Um, good sharp knife's good, but not too sharp. Uh, sheep skin isn't as thick as bulls or anything like that. So I come in, I find the spine and just make a cut. And what I usually do is I don't cut down because if you'll cut the hair, you want to get in and get your blade up and then just kind of, like I said, just follow the hump and it's never a race. You never want to try to do it fast. It's you mess up a sheep hide. You're kind of screwed. Let's put it that way. But if you do the, from the knife up on the inside up, you're not going to ruin the fur as much, anything like that. And then the other thing is if you can't see or get a good cut, stop cutting and then rearrange. Um, and then what you do is I, I come down, I find the back of the ribs and that's where I kind of go from there. And you just make a straight line down, but be careful when you're going this far back cause <laughs> you can poke the guts. And then just straight down. This is probably the most time consuming part. And then from there, like, I'm gonna make my cut on this side since we have them up and then you'll come in and then come from the armpit, but we'll get to that. But since we already have them up, then that way you can see your line too. Like kind of keep your straight line. And then if you need a little room, just skin it a little bit. And don't get me wrong, I've caped a lot of animals, but there's always different ways to do different things. I'm going to stay on this side because I don't know how the sun's going to look. And then take your time doing this. Keep your knife pointed down towards the meat. That way if something happens... You won't nick the skin because the more holes you put in it, the more your taxidermist is going to have to sew. But it's just one of those things. Just take your time. Time's always good. So I'm going to roll him back on the side here. So we can get to his... And don't worry about getting all the meat. Like I said, you're paying a taxidermist, you know, eight, 900 bucks. My taxidermist is probably gonna hate me for saying this, but <laughs> if you're paying a taxidermist that much money to um, do it for quality, but you also like, you don't wanna cut holes in it. Like they have special machines to flesh this and it's one of those things, it's a lot easier for them to do it. And most will tell you too, um, don't do it, I'll do it, kind of thing. All right. So, right here, um, we come down to this. We're just gonna do a circle around it. I think your shadows. I want to step just over here. Cause there you go. So basically, like you're getting ready to skin the leg. 
come down to the elbow. And then there's a line right here we're gonna follow. We're just gonna come down on the inside of that, inside of this, and then we're taking that line and we're just gonna come straight out right here. So, oops, sorry. Come in on the inside. All right, there's our inside. And then we're gonna follow it. And then you basically you come through the the thin part of that armpit and you do a line straight back and this helps you do the brisket and then you go straight back to the cut you made on the tee then you come back in here. Finish skinning just like you're doing an elk, but a lot slower, more cautiously. And always, I always try to keep my knife towards the meat. Like I said, even if you get a lot of meat on the hide, your taxidermist could take it off. Probably a lot easier to have your taxidermist take the meat off than sew a hole. And this knife's really good. It's really sharp, so the tip, I use the tip a lot. It's one of them things, again, you just don't want to race through it. You just want it nice and slow. Then what we'll do in between, before we flip this over, we'll harvest the meat off of it. We'll take it off. That way when we flip it over, it won't get all dirty. Keep your meat clean. We actually brought some, some meat bags. Okay. And like I said, like, Part of me wanted to keep going, but if you can't see, you really don't know what you're cutting. So, make sure you know what you're cutting. It's real difficult too to do this by yourself. Like you gotta find creative ways to get in there. There we go. And this is that T section that we cut. I know some people are gonna be like, look at all that meat. But I don't know. It's one of the points that my taxidermist couldn't stress to me enough, is don't worry about the meat, don't cut my hide, basically. Because when you sew it for, um, when you're putting it on a mount, it doesn't, it won't sit on there naturally, you know? And honestly, the way I learned how to do this was I seen it on like, the internet when i was younger i talked to the, my taxidermist and um come on can you want to get one of those bags out and we'll put this meat in there um my taxidermist did like a rough thing with me and he gave me these papers <laughs> that had uh that had um images of how to do it like cape animals trophy cape i think it was called Best way to take care of your meat in the field, one of them bags. So that gave us a little bit more room. Like I said, I don't think I'll go all the way up the neck. I'll go a little way. And then I'll try to get this a little bit more. And then stress again, 
if you can't see it don't try to stick your knife in there and cut it let's move the animal take your time I know there's probably some people out there probably saying I'd do that way faster but I guess when you shoot a big old ram and do it you do it your way <laughs> right right all right so basically we got most of this side done I'm starting to have a hard time seeing what I'm cutting and this is kind of a lot of people don't realize but this on shoulder mounts this is the part you see the front of this is what's on your wall this part so if you start hacking this up in here it's not worth it you might as well just stop what you're doing flip them over we'll harvest the back too right now since we still have the cape we got this side done what i do is i'll throw, throw the fur back on there so you don't get anything dirty and then since we're skinning them i'll probably just come follow this line down and then just skin them before we get them in that bag those meat bags are a saver honestly the person that introduced me to those was kamaikin <laughs> i didn't realize how good those bags are until you're you're out here and it's winter time and you see this like that will get all over your meat same thing with elk right now once they start getting their winter fur it's just one of them things where it's everywhere. So you take your time skinning an animal and doing it the right way. It just makes everything so much better. And these, we're gonna take a little bit more skin off up here. And we have an idea for this. There you go. That keep your nuts warm. Huh? <laughs> Wish you guys could see Aaron's face. Here you go, buddy. Ooh. Hot potato. <laughs> and then, I mean, goats are, a lot of the animal anatomy is the same. You come in here. I mean, I know all you guys have probably done deer and elk. And everybody has their different way of doing this. So I'm not trying to show you that my way is the best way or anything like that. I'm just showing you how the Whitefoots do it. And a lot of people ask me, like, how do you, you show them that this is called the gutless method. And um, it's different from what a lot of people do. Um, a lot of people say that you waste a lot of meat doing this way. But if you do the gutless method the right way, you can harvest every piece of meat on here that you would do gutting it. Like some people forget that they can actually reach the tenderloins from doing the gutless method. I've actually ran into people that said, that, how do you get the tenderloins out when you're doing that? And it's a little trick. You can't be, you get to be a little pokey. You just got to be gentle. It's nice and slow. And then uh, you won't have a problem with it, really. A lot of people cut those up when they cut them in. Yeah. And that's the other thing, cutting, because you're kind of cutting blind, right? When you're doing this, a lot of people just don't see where they're cutting. They go in there and you look and that, that tenderloin's already cut up into stew meat. Or they actually cut it up when they're ripping the, ripping the guts out. Then again, you're looking, I'm not sitting there stabbing it. We're taking our knife blade and we're going up with it. Yeah, and uh, when you're doing it, when you're skinning the back, you don't have to be as careful unless you're trying to keep the hide. So business as usual when you're doing the back leg. Just take your time and uh. 
And if you kind of do it this way, you kind of keep a lot of the nature's elements out of it. Cause so we already separated it from that joint in the bottom. So now basically this is just sitting on here cause of the hide. Only thing you gotta be careful of doing it this way is you don't want that leg to slip down. I would take these legs off, show you an easy way to do that, but I really don't want to dull my knife right now. And honestly, they're not as heavy as elk and deer legs. Most of you guys that's been around like goats and domestic sheep they're just about the same size as these bighorn sheep there's his tail now to, you could get around the tail but we really don't need to. You could get in between the vertebrae, see how easy that was to cut. All right, so now we're gonna finish taking off the hind quarter. We're just gonna come in here, follow that bone, just like that. Hind quarter. I'm not saying there's not fur on it, but there's minimal. <laughs> come over here to our trusty bags. All right, now we're gonna harvest the back strap. This, this one kind of took it there, but we could cut around it. So once you get in here, start your cut, you could kind of see where everything goes together. There's lines. And what I do is I'll just take my knife and do a series of small cuts. And it'll expose those lines. Like see, there's our lines that we were talking about. And you just go in there. So I guess we could talk about shot placement since we could see where he was shot. Um, these things are like a really tough animal. I've actually shot sheep before and I watched them run uphill. Most hunters will know that shooting elk and deer, when they're wounded, they'll run downhill, I think. This and mountain goats are probably the, some of the craziest animals to hunt because they'll straight up run up these hills. So. I chose not to do a heart shot. I chose to do um, a high shot, which is you try to break the spine and that way it takes everything out. He ain't gonna run. This was a one shot kill. He was eating right here and then he dropped. So I do high shots. A lot of people might argue about shot placement, shoot him in a heart, things like that. But it's your choice what to do. I mean, every hunter has their right and privilege to choose where they wanna shoot it, but I've honestly had more success in recovery and um, shorter tracking periods because, I mean, you still hit vitals, you break the back, I mean, all in all. Worst case scenario is you ruin a little bit of the back strap, but in my mind, risk versus reward, you want to lose four inches of back strap or you want a chance of losing this animal. These animals are tough animals. And whoever thinks they're not, I mean, you all have a right to your opinion, but my opinion is I've shot these things with 30 out sixes and with 300 wind megs, and it doesn't matter what round you take. Sometimes they'll get up and take off running. Cause you gotta think bull ruts, like when bulls are in full rut, I mean, sometimes them animals will take, you know, they'll run 200 yards with a hole in its heart. It doesn't matter, it's just how pumped up and you got to think animals will to survive, you know, that's their everyday thing is trying to survive. So, um, continuing to backstrap, like I said, everything on this animal has lines. We're just following these lines. I've seen a lot of people come in here and just start hacking. They'll start cutting these bones. And if you want a good way to ruin your knife real quick, a sharp knife, uh, start cutting the bone follow the line and then uh we can harvest more of this meat i'm just gonna stop that right there but look 
There's our back strap. This is our hip bone. This is where I started the back strap. We'll take a little bit more of that off. So um, we'll put this in the bag. Sorry, I'm over here taking pictures still. That's all right. Half photography. Oh. Might take it out and throw in a zip block later. So the gutless method, the tenderloin. So we all know the back strap, rib cage, your stomach, our legs. The tenderloins sit right back in here between this last rib and almost this hip joint kind of going here. The best way to get to them is I'll take my knife and come underneath these little uh, short ribs, right? And you cut gently because you got to be careful. You're real close to the guts right here. And then we talked about following lines. If you follow the lines right, we'll get in there. And a lot of this, here's our tenderloin. If you, you got a good angle of it. If you come on this side, we can. This is our tenderloin. This is our guts, right? So I just hold that tenderloin down, run my knife on the inside up along those bones. And then I pull down. And then you gotta be careful. You don't wanna just try to caveman it and rip that tenderloin straight out because it'll just fall apart. You just gotta keep going in there, see? And then what I do um, when we get right here is I stick my finger in it and kind of just slowly cut it out and bam. There is our sheep tenderloin. Gutless method right there. Because anything other than that, I mean, we'll harvest the meat off the ribs, the brisket, everything off this will be harvested. So people that say the, we'll put these in tenderloin, yeah. People that say that you don't harvest a lot of meat doing the gutless method, they're obviously just doing it wrong. So now it's time, we gotta flip the animal and then uh, do start on the same side. So what I'm gonna do make it easier i like the position he's at yes, i'll probably come right here and bring it back down on this side that way gravity helps us right. all right so now we come back in here we continue our line down that we couldn't see earlier right because we don't cut it if we can't see it, it's a good way to stab the guts. Then you'll have a poopy mess. Okay, there it is. There we go. And we're through all the way. And then we can um, come right here, start doing this. Just like we do on the elk. I'm kind of a little bit happier. My knife's a little bit duller. I was worried about how sharp it was when we first started. So then this is our line we're gonna follow. We kind of follow this right here. Then you kind of go straight down and then we make our cut, right? Um, some people tell you to uh, follow this too. Like they'll come in and then they'll go right across here and make a T. Uh, most of the taxidermists told me to come in, follow this line, and then come out right here. Because, I don't know, just preference, I guess. Like I said, there's probably a thousand different ways to do this. And it's all on the preference of your taxidermist. Basically, if you keep it in the armpit, you're not going to... You're not gonna see it because it's still gonna be like in the shoulder of the. Because there's one called the T method. I think that's called you make a line straight across and straight down. Mm -hmm. All right, so I got that started. I can't really see, so I'm gonna quit cutting right there and then we're gonna jump up here 
and we're gonna finish this off. Remember, like I said, we don't, you keep your knife pointed down towards the meat. And then when you keep them kind of downhill, it kind of keeps that gravity helps you. And like the tip of the knife seems to work the best for me because I could get it in there between the meat itself. And then if you keep constant pressure, like you see how I'm pulling, that also really helps too. Um, it gets real intimidating doing this your first time. I remember the first time I shot a ram, I was so excited and then Heck, it probably took me three hours just to <laughs> just to do this part of it because I was so scared. And I think I probably put like three or four holes in the thing. And the other kind of tip I have about taxidermists is you basically, you're going to get what you pay for, okay? What that means is if you shop around and you're looking for the cheapest price and you're like, well, so-and-so, he's a hundred or two hundred dollars cheaper. Yeah, that's great, but like you pay for what you get, you know? Huh? Go with what you know. Yeah, it's like, you know what? It takes a lot of people. I mean, I've seen people's stuff ruined. And they're like, yeah, you know, I got this. I paid, you know, $400 for this mount. And it looks like, you know, someone tanned the hide then just threw it on there and glued it, you know. It didn't look good. Um, the guy I go to, he's a little bit more expensive. But, man, he he does good. He does. He's won awards for what he's done. And uh, he, I just get along with him really well. He's just one of those guys that does a really good job. Takes his time. Cause you know some guys are like well how long does it take to get it back and to me it's it's patience you know be patient the longer it takes i mean you might in the long run get a way better quality piece that's gonna last a lifetime that's the other thing if they're preserved wrong and done wrong the hair could fall out in a matter of years you know so like i said you you get what you pay for Now, we're kind of getting into that territory where it's getting a little harder. So, after I take this off, I'm, I'm trying not to pull a lot of the, like, because you don't want to come in here and grab the hair and pull it out. So, that's what being careful is about like this. See, like this meat, I'm getting to the point where it's like, all right, well, let's just leave a little bit more meat on there. And uh, worry about that when the, we take it to the taxidermist. Because the neck, when you get into this neck area, I think that's my most difficult part because you're in an area where a lot of it's hot, you know, tough. Because, I mean, just that's the way the animals are built. That, you think the predators, the predators that these rams have, they all go through for the throat, you know, and things like that. So that skin's gonna be just a little bit tougher. That, and then the other thing I think is this brisket part. I think that's one of the most attached meat to the skin is where this brisket is. And the brisket's this part right here, I think. On almost any animal that I skin, I, I see that the meat's attached to the skin really, really strong in that point. So we're taking this off. Just follow the lines, you'll see the meat kind of coming apart. And like a don't saw, you don't gotta saw, that's how you dull your knife, just cut. Nice, flat. 
fluid cut just like that. Got a little grass on it, but we can clean that later. Got you. All right, now the back again. We're gonna do the same thing as we did on the other ones. We're gonna come up, skin the back here. And this is, we don't have to be extremely careful, but careful enough to where we don't ruin the meat, of course. But I guess you could say not reckless, but you could speed up your process. Make up the time for how long it took for the front. Then again, remember our cuts. You want to cut from this knife's finally getting dull. The inside. Right? So we don't get fur. And then the core stuff. And if you get a little dirt on the outside, I just rinse it off right now and then we'll figure, you know, you could clean it when you get back to camp. But being as clean as you can with the meat in the beginning will save you hours of getting fur off the hide or off the mean so when you get to the pelvis here you can look if you take your knife in there there's a bone and this bone's kind of a oddly shaped because you, you want to go straight but this this has it has like a little knob on it so it's a little harder to find but if you get in there and you take your knife you could actually stick your knife under here push your blade against that bone and then it'll guide your blade all the way around this little knob I'm talking about and you can see this knob like right here it doesn't matter it seems like I always have trouble with it but see that like that little knob you come up and then you could just follow it around and then you're good you come on this side you get in there get your knife back to this and then you just keep pushing against that bone this bone right here you just let your knife follow it up and then uh, you just follow you just keep following it just like slowly pull the meat away as you're doing it it'll help you get all that meat off And then our hide's still connected right here. Do that since we already cut the top. We can get right here and finish it. And see a little bit of dirt got on that because we we're uphill. But if you skin it, you can cut it. See, and that all of a sudden it means <laughs> dirty. Like I said, the cleaner you keep it out here, the um, easier it is on you back in the kitchen. And we're just basically doing the same thing we did to the other leg come up to that joint and hit it. Now I'm gonna flip this over since we have clean meat on this side. <clears throat> A little bit of fur. And if, I mean, like I said, you get fur on it, it's not gonna be a big issue. The cleaner you can do it out here I know I'm repeating myself a lot, but if you understand that, I'm trying to stress it to you guys a lot to keep it clean. Because <laughs> the cleaner you keep it, the less wastage you have when you go to trim everything off. 
in the kitchen, right? So here's her next leg. See that fur, a little bit of fur. Usually with your hand, you, it'll come off. The last leg. Yeah. Go. Yeah, we can do that. And then we'll figure it out. Okay, so we have the back strap left. Remember our lines we were talking about. This is the one part that actually dulls your knife up a lot. There's no real, I mean, there's ways, but no matter what, you're destined to run your knife along a bone when you're doing the back strap. Because that's your guide, or the guide I use, the guide my family uses, is you use that, those top of the ribs. We're gonna come up here. We're actually gonna cut the, cut it right there, and then when we take the neck meat, we will go around it. It's a little angle. You could come in here, start it. What I do is I'll poke a hole in it, get your finger through each side of it, make your life a little bit easier. Here's these lines we we're talking about again. I mean, there's a little meat. It's going to be hard to harvest every meat off of it or every little bit, but you can get almost all of it. Then you just go right to that bone. Come down that line we talked about earlier. And just like that. Our back strap. Okay, the uh, last thing we got left, or second to last thing, is our tenderloin again. We do it just like the last time. Come in, we find those top of those ribs, slice that uh, kind of a, I guess you'd call it membrane. And then I clean it with my hand, I'll run it along in there, that way it moves everything. Then I come in here. And this one, you know, I talk about try not to cut blind. It's kind of hard not to cut blind. But if you do it from the top, let gravity take that the inside guts down. It actually gives you um, a better view of what you're cutting. The sun's helping us too. We can actually see a little bit in there. And then the other thing you gotta worry about is you're dangerously close to cutting near the gut bag when you do the gutless method. I mean dangerously close. You can see it right there. So I usually try to run my... Oh, there we go. Try to run my knife down there. Got our tenderloin. Go back and talk about keeping our stuff clean. Um, we can do net harvest some of this neck meat, but I really want to go a little higher on this head. That way. We can hit that fucking edge, or that edge. So this part's even harder because by now you've wasted a lot of your energy and it's really easy to get fatigued and just start slicing. So if you think you're getting tired, Take a break, drink some water, talk with your friends, live in the moment because you hunters know that killing the animal is part of the hunt. The other part, of course, is taking care of it. 
third part to me is the the camaraderie you have with your family and your friends hunting buddy you know this is where the memories are made i think the most is you know we talk about this is our medicine and this is where a lot of your passion comes from i think like what you get so excited about hunting is like a lot of people like the thrill of the chase and me that's fun i'm not saying it's not fun but there's there's more there's other enjoyable moments i think that you can have and a lot of it comes from the process of it because you think you take the meat back to camp our home you have kids they're excited to see what you brought you know they like hearing the story some kids you know participate like i know some families that it's a family adventure when dad brings home some meat right you get the whole family involved that's how i am my kids are young but they still like picking up knives and you think our people back in the day you still had job if you were little right so now i'm gonna take some of this neck meat off it's gonna make our life a little easier this is where i shot him so i'm gonna come up a little higher and we're gonna trim that bloodshot meat off it has uh, bullet fragments in it and um, we're just gonna set it aside for our friends vultures, coyotes, things like that. So uh, a lot of people ask, like, what do you do with the neck meat? Same thing. Even if you don't know what you're doing, these animals are all put together. It's like you could just follow lines, cut the meat in big chunks, and then when you get home, you could look it up or message us or somebody. I mean, there's somebody that you know knows how to process animals. Ask them, hey, how do I do this? But the funny thing is, is when we was little learning, it was kind of like, all right, that's big enough to make a steak. <laughs> we make a steak out of it. So this would be considered one of your neck roasts. I'm gonna cut this neck roast a little short because my hide's still connected. Nice little neck roast. Try to harvest as much meat as you can off these animals. Okay. All right, so now I'm gonna slip my hide under here because once I cut this throat of this, uh, sheep the bile might come out which usually it does and now i'm going to change the positions of the animal to come up in here and try to cut this see you typically you would want to get higher up here but if you can't um there's a joint you can hit but it's hard to do because I don't like, like I said, I don't like um, cutting the fur away from the horns itself. I mean, if we were deeper or like if you're on a guided hunt where you have to pack it out and you don't want to pack that head out, it'd be different. But fortunately, we're not. What I do is I'll come in and find a vertebrae somewhere in between and then um try to what'd you say try to come in here and bust his neck like that 
heard the pop. Then the other thing, you gotta be careful what you're cutting again. You don't wanna cut the fur. So be careful what you're cutting. And just like that, you have your trophy ram cake. <laughs> Process the animal. And then the other thing I guess we could go over is storage. So you don't want to try to keep this clean, but in the environment we're in, kind of hard. There's a, some meat on there, like I said, but better meat than holes. When you store this, if you have to store it long term and you want to freeze it, you got to make sure the fur doesn't go against the inside of the skin because what happens is when it freezes the hide will actually freeze to the wet part of this so what you want to do is fold it to where skin touches skin right so same thing with down here and then what i do is i roll it you roll it up like that and then it sits on your bag perfectly. And we have a piece of string, we'll tie it up. Just like that, trophy ram cape and the bone in the field. We got a little bit more of the rib cage to take off, but that's about it. Thanks for watching. Thank you.